Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gerald Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening and to have you make time for us in, in your schedules. Tonight's program has been planned in conjunction with the University of Michigan theme year on museums. While other presentations have focused on the place of museums and special collections within the academy, tonight we're thinking a little more broadly about some very special libraries and archives and museums across the country, three of which are cited at university campuses. The LBJ Presidential Library at the University of Texas, the Bush 41 Library at Texas A&M, and the Ford Library here at the University of Michigan. The organizer of the U of M theme year is Carla Sinopoli, who is professor of anthropology and director of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of Michigan, and we're delighted that she's here. Carla, take a bow for organizing a wonderful year of events. As with most of our programs, tonight's presentation is made possible with important support from two groups. First is our parent organization, the National Archives and Records Administration, and the second is the Ford, Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. I'm pleased that the foundation's executive director, Joe Calvaruso, and his wife, Donna, are here with us this evening. Joe, would you like to stand? Tonight's distinguished speaker comes representing our major source of the library and museum support. For Sharon Fawcett is the assistant archivist for presidential libraries within the National Archives. In this position, she provides policy direction and oversight of the 13 presidential libraries in the system and oversees the presidential materials staff that works with the records of the current administration. Sharon brings unique credentials to her position as she was literally born into presidential libraries. Her parents' home in Abilene, Kansas, sits on or was on what is now part of the parking lot of the Eisenhower Presidential <laughs> Library. So this is destiny for her. <laughs> After earning degrees in history and library science at the University of Texas in Austin, Sharon's has spent most of her professional career in some part of the presidential library system. As a new graduate, she began her career at the LBJ Library, where she assisted President Johnson with research for his book, The Vantage Point. What an incredible experience for a young professional. After several years there, she moved to a position with the National Archives in Washington. She later left the archives to work as a consultant in Iowa for eight years before returning in 1988. Since then, she has held increasingly responsible management positions as Director of User Services and then Deputy Assistant Archivist for Presidential Libraries prior to her appointment to the current position in late 19 I interviewed her for, th with, for this position in November and December, and I believe I might have been her first hire in her, in her new position as head of presidential libraries, and I truly hope she doesn't regret it on a daily basis. <laughs> In leading the presidential libraries, Sharon has encouraged the regional diversity and uniqueness of each library while encouraging cross-library collaboration. She has encouraged development of special programs and educational outreach to serve local communities where the libraries are located, while fostering the use of technology to provide virtual access to collections and museum exhibits for remote visitors. At each of the 13 libraries, she deals with diverse issues, ranging from aging facilities as well as brand new ones, archival processing queues, FOIA challenges, changing technologies, and evolving staffing needs, along with the diverse personalities and style and culture of each library. Sharon also deals with the unique dynamics of every president and his family, and the varied interest and involvement each one has with the library and museum versus their other post-presidential interests. She's a strong champion of the unique public-private partnership that the libraries have with their respective institutions or foundations, and has testified frequently before Congress on this and a number of other issues. Sharon is the first woman and the first librarian to hold her position, and the breadth and depth of her background make her very well prepared and well suited for this challenge. We as directors feel very, very fortunate to have Sharon as the head of presidential libraries on the national level. Please join me in welcoming Sharon Fawcett as she shares her perspective on the history and the future of presidential libraries. Sharon? Thank you, Elaine. That was an absolutely incredible introduction. I, I hope I can live up to it today, tonight. Um, 
when Elaine um, asked me to do this program about museums, and I want to thank Carla too for um, organizing this theme year on museums at the University of Michigan, I you know, very quickly agreed, but then she asked me what I wanted to talk about. So I gave that a little thought. I think we had a little email going back and forth. And I finally settled on this to reflect on the dilemmas of history, legacy, and politics, because that's often where the controversies arise in presidential libraries. I, I swear, they just swear, swirl around the libraries. I, I know I've spent a lot of time testifying before Congress and talking to journalists about presidential libraries. Um, and so I wanted to discuss this tonight and, and go through uh, a few examples of situations that we've had throughout the library system. But, but first, I want to, full disclosure, I love presidential libraries. I love their strengths as a system of libraries that house some of our most significant historical records. I also love the uniqueness of each of these museums and repositories and how each one reflects the president himself. I think of Franklin Roosevelt in the Hudson Valley and LBJ in the Hill Country and Eisenhower coming from the heart of America. And I think of Gerald Ford, you know, sort of bifurcated across the state of Michigan, not unlike Michigan itself, as I understand from people who live here. Um, I also want to say I voted in every presidential election since I was eligible to vote, 11 elections so far, don't do the math. <laughs> my, my candidate won in fewer than half of those elections. So to me, a presidential library is not really about the party that, or the partisanship of the vote or who won or the views of the individuals. The library is about us, the American people. It's about the issues that have been important to us. It's about the times that we have witnessed and learned from. And it's about the men that we have elected, at least the men so far that we've elected to this office. Even if you don't identify with the views and actions taken by, say, Bill Clinton or George W. Bush or whoever many of these other men have been, that's the heart of our system of government. If we do nothing else in presidential libraries, I hope we can teach civility and discourse and empathy for other views. 71 years ago, FDR propo proposed creating the first presidential library to house his papers, his many collections, and the gifts accumulated during his administration. On this slide, you'll see some of his ship models. He had a very large collection of ships, some of which he built and many of which were given to him. To make the library happen, FDR donated a piece of land near his home in Hyde Park, and he created a foundation to build the library. FDR was even the architect of his library. We still have in our archival collections this yellow legal-sized piece of paper on which he sketched what he thought the library should look like. It's a Dutch colonial building made out of blue field stone. It's a beautiful building, and it very much reflects the Hudson Valley and FDR. Roosevelt dedicated his library in 1941 to future generations, even as the war in Europe began to threaten democracy. This, this model of building a private library and turning it over to the government uh, became the, uh, the future model for presidential libraries. And uh, there's one thing, though, that was very different about the FDR library. FDR was the only president to actually occupy the library while in office. So he had an office in the library. And it's very interesting, when he was planning D-Day, he had many of his war cabinet up at Hyde Park, and they were meeting in the president's office. And he left to go back to his uh, house in Hyde Park to have lunch. And the director of the library walked into the office, and here were the plans for D-Day arrayed all over the desk. <laughs> The director quickly swooped them all up, put them in the safe, and then worried for the next several days until after the D-Day event happened. But I, I, I love that story about the library. This is another exhibit from the FDR library. I actually love this picture, and I love that image of FDR. Arrayed around the room are various images and statues of FDR. The role of the presidential libraries has changed a lot since FDR first donated the land building and some of the papers and the memorabilia to the National Archives in 1941. 
He wanted the American people to be able to see these wonderful treasures, these gifts, these um, artifacts that had been given to him or that he had collected over the years. There were New Deal art, there were cars, there were stamps, there were butterflies, there were stuffed birds, there were an amazing array of things that he had uh, in his collections. So the early exhibit in the library wasn't about the life and times of the president, it was about his stuff. And um, you know, part, you know, partly after all, he was still president. So uh, maybe it would have been a little bit uh, egotistical to have written the history while it was still being written. So uh, the, the library very much was a museum of artifacts. But changes began to be made in the early 50s. And ever so slowly, the collections migrated into the vaults, into the storage areas. And the exhibits were replaced with exhibits that were more historical in nature and told about the life and times of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. So uh, today, less than 10% of the Roosevelt Library collection has ever been exhibited, and less than 3% is on display today. Now, the FDR Library, which is well over 65 years old, is undertaking a major renovation. It has, you know, 65 years old. You know what happens to buildings that are that old? It still has the original building systems in it. You can't imagine. There are leaks and there are all sorts of problems. So uh, with the funding that came from Congress to do the renovation, the library director and the Roosevelt family are raising money to build a visible storage area. And this, you'll go down, you'll, you'll see exhibits on the top floor, and you'll go down to the lower level, and you'll be able to walk through uh, these storage areas and see artifacts that we don't often get a chance to put on display. And if you look down here in the corner, you'll see uh, a rendering of what the ship models might look like. But here's furniture in China and head of state gifts, and back in there is a car. So this is a wonderful way to allow access to these collections. Now, artifacts have not always been just wonderful items to display. They've also been controversial. And some of you may remember um, two or three years ago, there were headlines in the newspaper that presidential libraries weren't doing a very good job of keeping track of their artifacts. Um, in late 1996, when I um, accepted the position of deputy assistant archivist of presidential libraries, I accepted it on the condition that I could work towards three goals that I had. And one of the goals was to bring the National Archives around to understanding that we were in the museum business. You know, after all, we were the National Archives and Records Administration, not the National Artifacts and Records Administration. So I undertook as part of this transformation uh, to look at how we could systematize the cataloging of all the artifacts in the collection. I wanted to make them more available to the public and to researchers. We have an amazing number of pre-Columbian artifacts. We have costume design. You know, if you're studying the history of, of costume or fashion in the United States, you can go look at, at what Eleanor Roosevelt wore, what Mamie Eisenhower wore, or, or Rosalind Carter, or Betty Ford. I mean, these are all wonderful examples of uh, the clothing arts in this country. And, you know, and by cataloging them all and putting them into a database and then allowing researchers access to them, they'd know what existed in the presidential libraries and have the opportunity to come and study them. The li we, and so we identified some cataloging resources and bought museum software. We didn't have any funding for this. I kind of rolled it out to the libraries, this software, one or two libraries at a time. Uh, and uh, the libraries worked on it as they could. We didn't have additional resources to pay for this type of cataloging. The Reagan Library was the very last library to receive the software, and they didn't get it until about, I think it was about 2003. In 2007, our OIG conducted an audit of our management controls of the artifact collections. And some of the libraries by that time, including the Ford Library, have been able to complete their 100% inventories. But the Reagan Library hadn't even been able to begin. And uh, the IG went public with their report 
the day that Mrs. Reagan's dress exhibit opened at the Reagan Library. And so as Mrs. Reagan is walking into the Presidential Library to open this premier exhibit that had been done at the library, the headlines in the Los Angeles Times screeched that the Reagan Library had lost 80,000 artifacts. Um, and that's because we had, didn't, you know, the artifacts were there, they just hadn't been inventoried, so we didn't have a catalog of them listed. Now this sh slide shows me at a preview for um, the George W. Bush Library. We were getting ready to move the collections from Washington, D.C., the records, the artifacts, to Louisville, Texas, which is where our temporary site is. And on the table right there, you'll see a pair of boots that were made by a Texas bootmaker. And as I recall, there was a picture of Barney on those boots. <laughs> and I'm explaining to the press how we're going about this move. I put this slide up here because I wanted to talk about what we have done. You know, that this again was part of that process of professionalizing our handling of museum collections and presidential libraries. In 1997, when I began as Deputy Assistant Archivist, I knew we had to have a better way of managing our collections and managing the gifts and artifacts that came to us from the White House. See, a lot of people don't realize it, but in the White House, we actually, I mean, in the National Archives, we store 70% of the records created by the president during his administration, and 100% of the artifacts are stored over in the National Archives. So I, we, we bought a cataloging system, a professional system, and began the process of cataloging uh, the Clinton artifacts. So by the end of the Clinton administration, we had cataloged 100% of the head of state gifts and over 50% of the, um, of the uh, domestic gifts. Well, at the end of the Bush administration, we had cataloged everything, 100% of the collection. So fortunately, no future presidential library will face a mountain of conflicting paperwork. We had pink sheets, we had green sheets, we had crate lists, we had stairs records, we had gift unit correspondence. We had all these various items that talked about various gifts and items that had been given to the president. But there was no single list that told us what exactly had been transferred to the library. So now we absolutely know. And I'm really pleased to say that the Reagan Library has finished their um, inventory and they are um, putting the final touches on their final report. <coughs> Elaine talked about uh, my beginning my career at the LBJ Library and this is me. <laughs> Two weeks after I would started at the LBJ Library. Shortly after leaving office, President Johnson visited the four existing presidential libraries. There were only four at the time, uh, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, and Hoover. And this, this, visit, this particular meeting takes place after he had returned from the Hoover Library. Now, I'm sitting, I'm meeting the president, and I'm sitting in this, unfortunately, a swivel chair. <laughs> and I am very young, and I am very nervous. And I've been told that, because I don't remember this, but people afterwards told me that I was swiveling back and forth <laughs> all the time the president was talking to me. And you can kind of see that I was doing that in this picture. And the president's head was going like this. <laughs> but the interesting thing about that meeting because it, it, it really tells me almost everything I needed to know about presidential libraries after this meeting. LBJ told us that he had always heard that Herbert Hoover had caused the Great Depression and had done little to reverse it, had called out the, the National Guard to take action against the bonus marchers, and all in all, he was a complete failure as a president. Now, I think at this particular moment in his life, not four weeks after he had left office, he probably identified a lot with Herbert Hoover. But among the things that he learned about Herbert Hoover is that he helped an estimated 120,000 Americans find their way home at the outbreak of World War I. World War I. And he said he personally, Herbert Hoover personally loaned 
one and a half million dollars to these desperate travelers in order for them to get home. Now one and a half million dollars, this was Herbert Hoover's own money, is a lot of money in 19, whatever, 14, 15, when, when this occurred. All but $400 was returned to Herbert Hoover, oh, wow. thus confirming Hoover's belief in the American character. Then later, when Hoover, you know, after the war, um, and or, or actually, there was a, um, a blockade uh, of Belgium, and the Germans, the Belgians were trapped between the German bayonets and a blockade, and they were starving to death. Belgium was a country that imported nearly 90% of its food. So Herbert Hoover organized a relief effort, and um, this this particular picture shows Herbert Hoover standing in front of part of his collection of flour sacks. These flour sacks contain flour that were sent from America to Belgium. The, Be the grateful Belgians embroidered these flour sacks and sent them back, and they're really quite beautiful. There's a fantastic collection at the Hoover, Herbert Hoover Library. And the, uh, on the other side is a picture from, this isn't the, picture, this isn't the library LBJ saw, this is from the current exhibit uh, talking about uh, the relief effort. Now, so as LBJ, and you can see him right there, LBJ with his back turned, speaking to the staff, he looked around the table at this brand new staff of the library, and he said, you know, after he left, you know, after he left the library, he thought of Hoover as a great man and a great humanitarian. And he looked around at all of us and he said, and that's what I want you to do for me. <laughs> and I would say this. Today, the LBJ Library, and I have friends who were there when I was there, and I left the LBJ Library in 1977, and I have friends who are still there working in the library, and I think we're all very proud of what we've accomplished in that library. And we accomplished it through a great deal of openness. LBJ was very willing to open his collection, and so the records are there. After he died, he had put restrictions on the presidential conversations, but after he died, the director of the library went to Mrs. Uh, Johnson and said, I don't think we should wait till fi for 50 years to open this collection of tapes. And so the library began processing the tapes, and I think largely because of what we've opened at the library, uh, it, we've been able to sort of reclaim LBJ's reputation as a master legislator. Now, I just want to point out one thing about this slide, because it is the 60s after all. Notice all the women sitting on that side of the room. And uh, you'll notice it's almost all men sitting around the table with LBJ and standing behind him are men. So it was the 60s. Now, interestingly, what LBJ did not see at the Hoover Library was any serious analysis of the Great Depression. While Herbert Hoover's sons, Herbert Hoover III and Alan Hoover lived, the Great Depression and Hoover's role were not depicted in any analytical historical con uh, context. Um, but today, and this is part of the exhibit, and I know it's not the greatest picture in the world, but this is part of the exhibit on the, uh, on, on the Great Depression. The exhibit shows um, Hoover's early concerns about gambling on Wall Street, and it points to Hoover's early efforts from the crash to underpin the economy and jobs. The exhibit concludes that Hoover failed to understand the forces at work in the economy and the decline of agriculture exacerbated by the drought. In the Hoover Library today, there is a very different, though not unsympathetic, portrayal of Hoover and his response to the Depression. Hoover adopted a very bloody but unbowed stand. I cannot take time away from my job to answer such stuff, he said, about the many questions that came in, the many things he was asked to, to give responses to. At the same time, it must be said that Hoover did very little to advance his own cause. Um, he built speeches a bit like an engineer, and he was an engineer, a mining engineer, a bit like, a, a bit like an engineer builds a bridge. And uh, he delivered his st statistic-laden speeches in a dishwatery tone of voice, and that's exactly what it says in the exhibit. 
His face wore the look of a condemned man, not a confident leader. You can't make a Teddy Roosevelt out of me, he explained apologetically. So this exhibit is from Hero to Scrap Goat, and um, it goes on to say that Hoover's failure to dramatize himself, dramatize himself, was his greatest strength as humanitarian, but his greatest flaw as a politician. Now last June, this is a picture of a gallery at the uh, Richard Nixon Library. We received a letter from a Los Angeles resident of Chinese descent. To quote, my wife and I visited the Nixon Library a few months ago. When I went to this section with a display of bronze figures of world leaders, I was shocked to have found that Mao's figure, along with Chao's, was displayed in a prominent position with intention to glorify and romanticize the biggest mass murderer in human history. The gross moral confusion and corruption in the decision made to display such figures horrified my wife and me. I am collecting signatures for a petition to remove and dismantle these statues from the Nixon Library. Thus began a very extensive correspondence with this young man uh, who did indeed collect hundreds of signatures and he actually later organized a small demonstration at the library. Now, the irony of receiving this letter is that the government appointed library director there expressed very much the same thought about these statues, particularly the statue of Mao, at the time the library transferred uh, to the government and Rich, the Richard Nixon Library didn't come into the government until 2007. Um, it was a private library until then. Well, the National Archives Partners, the Library Foundations, and are the principal fundraisers and supporters of our exhibit programs in the libraries, and this gallery was a very great favorite of the foundation and the Nixon docents. So we weren't, a, we weren't ready to take this gallery down. You know, uh, we, don't ha we didn't have funding. The, the, the foundation hadn't raised money yet at this point in time to redo the exhibits. And so we wanted to leave this in, these in place. But we wanted to do a little bit to placate uh, the, the writer of the letter. And so we posted uh, this sign in the gallery that indicates that uh, they're there because, of, uh, because they're world figures that Nixon dealt with and they're not meant to glorify uh, Mao and Xiao. But the interesting thing, when you think about Chinese culture and uh, you know, statues are very meaningful to them and I think they're less meaningful in our culture so it was much more symbolic for uh, this Chinese writer than it might be for us. Now, I don't mean to pick on, uh, on, on Nixon, but this is another example of the kind of controversies that come to play in the libraries. I think there are always events that will arouse a great deal of passion, and many of those events are often depicted in presidential libraries. And the killing of the Kent State students during the student demonstrations following the announcement of the New American South Vietnamese offensive into Cambodia is an example of that. This slide on this screen depicts the Ohio's historical state marker about this event. And the slide reads, a small number of protesters taunted the guard from the Prentice Hall parking lot. The guard marched back to the pagoda where members of Company A and Troop G turned and fired 61 to 67 shots during 13 seconds. Four students were killed. Nine students were wounded. The President's Commission on Campus Unrest concluded that the shootings were unnecessary, unwarranted, and inexcusable. Now the exhibit at the Nixon Library, uh, which, which was part of um, the original transfer, captures this tragic moment in some very different words. And the words are much more sympathetic uh, portrayal of the National Guard. Uh, in fact, the text in the museum says the guards Men, many the same age as the students, were pelted with rocks and chunks of concrete. Tragically, in the ensuing, in the ensuing panic, shots rang out and four students lay dead. And this picture here is of um, Jeffrey Miller, and you all may recall the very famous picture of the dead student and the young woman over his body screaming. I think the picture was taken by another student named John Philo, but since it's a, Pul it's a, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning photo and it's copyrighted, I'm not using it in my presentation since it's being televised. 
Well, Tim Neff Alley, the very same director who had a concern about the statues uh, at the exhibit gallery, um, is an historian on the Cold War and an expert on terrorism, and uh, he's, uh, he's the director of the library. And he's working to make some changes in the library so it presents what historians would see as a more complete historical record of Nixon's work. As an example, Tim often points to this particular caption about Kent State. Um, well, after Tim made these remarks and they were picked up in a newspaper, there was a great controversy that ensued in the blogosphere. And the original drafter of the Nixon exhibit became involved in this controversy and came to speak of this and, and Tim Naftali's comments as showing his anti-Nixon bias. But interestingly, coming to Nixon's defense were um, some other folks who identified Tim as an historian and said historians usually do not use the passive voice in writing. They would say, the guardsmen fired the shots, their shots killed four students. So this is, again, you know, an example of some of the controversies that occur in the libraries. This is a, a picture of the facade of the Nixon Library. Uh, there's a scholar named Benjamin Huffbauer who often writes on presidential libraries and public, uh, and public history, and he is, um, he's a critic of presidential libraries, quite frankly. Um, he often relates their exhibits to the life cycle of the presidential library. He says, essentially, every library goes through at least three phases in its life. First, there's its founding and the initial development, largely controlled by the president and his supporters on the museum side. Second, the organization and opening of its archives for use by scholars and largely controlled by the National Archives. And third, a period of maturity when a presidential library must reinvent itself to remain relevant. Now, the transition of the Nixon Library to the National Archives has you know, been troubling at times, and some of these controversies have created a lot of polarization around the issues. But it's been 36 years since President Nixon left office, and normally, in that stage, we would be well into the maturity phase of a library. The exhibits would begin to explore controversial subjects and look at them more frankly as the exhibit that you saw on the Great Depression at the Hoover Library. But, you know, I think part of the problem at Nixon is that the library is so new to the National Archives, it's almost like it was the library of a president who just left office and not a president who's been out of office 35 or 36 years. This is a slide from the exhibit at the Truman Library on the decision to drop the atomic bomb. There's almost nothing more controversial in the library system than an exhibit about the dropping of the atomic bomb. And some of you may remember the Smithsonian attempted to do an exhibit on the atomic bomb and the Enola Gay and ended up having to close down that exhibit because it erupted in so much controversy. So I think that the Truman Library has done an incredible job in portraying this very controversial subject. And, and let me read to you the words, and you can't read them on this slide screen, but I'll read to you what they tell you when you come as a visitor to visit that museum. The years of Harry Truman's presidency are crowded with significant and controversial events. Historians and non-experts alike bring a variety of perspectives to the study of these momentous times. Sifting through the same evidence, they often reach conflicting confusions. This exhibit presents one interpretation of the Truman presidency. There are other ways of looking at the subjects presented here. As you visit the galleries, you will encounter flip books that highlight some of these alternative views. You know, and it goes on to say that the diverse views in this exhibit also acknowledge an important truth. History never speaks with one voice. It is always under debate a manuscript that is continually being revised and is never complete. An example of that, this headline I woke up to one morning a couple of years ago, I think in July 19, 2005, several prominent Holocaust scholars demanded that the federally funded Roosevelt Museum revise a display caption that, it, that they say downplayed FDR's complicity in the slaughter of six million Jews. 
the caption acknowledged, the caption that they were um, concerned about, uh, which was a, um, a picture, a Torah that had been uh, 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 given to Roosevelt. The, capture, the caption acknowledged stains on the American record and mentioned the country's failure to open its borders to fleeing Nazis. But the sentence that sparked the outrage continued. Yet even Roosevelt's bitterest critics concede that nothing he could have done, including bombing the rails leading to Auschwitz in 1944, would have saved significant numbers from annihilation, let alone dissuading the Nazis from doing what they were so intent on doing. Well, there's significant debate among historians, and there are those who cite numerous steps that could have been taken, granting refugees temporary visas, um, bombing the rails, pressing the British to open Palestine to the refugees, etc. But others point to the isolationism and anti-Semitic sentiments in this country and said that actually prevented FDR from opening our borders. So we did change the caption. You know, uh, we looked at it, this caption, the caption that was in place that the scholars were complaining about in 2005 had actually been in the library since 1994. And we took a look at it and said, you know, um, that's kind of waffling to say even his bitterest critics concede that wasn't even actually true because uh, the bitterest critics were not conceding that fact. So today we say historians continue to debate whether the actions FDR could have taken would have made a difference. Now interestingly about this, one of the scholars that was involved in this controversy at the time actually um, returned to the FDI lib FDR library to do research. And in doing research for a publication of um, James McDonald's diaries, he came to a, com a different view of Roosevelt and found that there were some things that Roosevelt was trying to do. And so he actually um, came away with a better view than he had started out with. So that just, again, goes to show how history continues to evolve as people look and delve more and more into the records. Uh, the Carter Library is a library that's reaching its mo a more mature stage. And um, interestingly, they just redid their exhibit, which had been there since the library opened in 1983. Um, and it's, it's very interesting um, because we were redoing this exhibit while President Carter still lived. And I think the interesting thing about this exhibit is how it changed in the treatment of the Iran hostage crisis, uh, which was a major crisis in, in uh, Jimmy Carter's administration. Um, in the first original exhibit in the library, uh, there's some discussion of Carter's personal anguish over the crisis um, and the toll that it took on him, but there were things that were left out. Uh, some of you may remember that the Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance, resigned because he did not agree with Carter's decision uh, to try and rescue the hostages. The new exhibit, however, um, it has a much more personal voice in it, and Carter is much more reflective. And you know, it's been a lot of years, 35, 40 years have passed, so he's able to look at it a little more dispassionately. And he says he was restrained from a preemptive strike by the realization that the Iranian hot fanatics would probably certainly kill the hostages. The exhibit includes a very frank interview between uh, Brian Williams and the President, President Carter, about the crisis. And he talks about how it severely distorted everything else that he did in that year. And interestingly, the Cyrus Vance letter of resignation is in this exhibit. We went, all the directors went down to the library in February to look through the exhibit, and we had this incredible docent. Who, t who took us through the library. And I think what I liked about this exhibit is that it, t it you know, I think it's probably one of the, one of the best exhibits of, uh, done with a living president. And it's not unlike the, many, many of you, because you're here, have probably been to the Ford Museum. And I very much admire that exhibit also because it uses Ford's voice throughout the exhibit. So it's very clear 
who the narrator is of this exhibit, who's telling this story. It's the president telling this story. It's his point of view. It's his vantage point. And there are opportunities in the museum for, um, for the library staff, for the people who, who help to curate the exhibit to give other examples of, um, uh, of historical interpretation throughout the exhibit. But Carter, you know, one of the things I noted most about this exhibit is right near the end of it, as you, as you move into the exhibit about Carter's post-presidential life, he says, very frankly, he says, I left office a very angry man. And he wouldn't have said that when he, uh, in the first exhibit, when he first left office. So it's very fascinating. He also came up and talked to all the directors. Um, after this tour, he came up to the, our meeting room. And he and his, and Mrs. Carter talked about some of the work they were doing in Africa. And they described Guinea worm disease. And if you don't know what this disease is, it's, it's these worms that get into your body from the water supply, and then they come out through your skin after they've been through a cycle in your body. And it is a horrible, burning, awful, painful experience. Very hard on children, very hard on adults. Uh, we were very uncomfortable with this, but um, Carter and the Carter Center, when they began this project to work towards eradication, there were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases every year. Last year, there were less than 200 cases of guinea worm worldwide. And it's a disease, it's a worm that has to have a human host, so if you, if you end uh, not being able to provide a host for it, you will eventually eradicate it. One of the things I liked about what happened at the Carter Library is that in designing the museum, Jay Hakes had very much in mind a 2006 marketing study that we did. And among the key findings of that were that visitors were mostly over 55 and uh, had adult children living outside the home. So among potential visitors to the library, we were able to find out that people wanted a place to bring their children and, uh, uh, and to give them a great educational experience. Um, and we do provide great educational experiences in our classrooms in the libraries, but these are, this would be a family-based experience. And so this is uh, an ad that was done by the child of one of the uh, uh, library staff. When I am president, I will swim every day and invite over my friends. <laughs> Has your child been to the Oval Office yet? And another piece that came out of, um, of that study is to create an experience in the museum that children would want to be a part of. And here you have this interactive table. It's like a giant iPhone. It's really cool. And up to 18 students can gather around this table uh, you travel the world with Jimmy Carter. This really is, a, is, a, is an exhibit about his post-presidential life. And it's very interactive. Teachers love it for um, the ability to teach geography to students. Now, at the Ford Library, we have a cabinet room. And I think it's too bad they didn't have smart table technology in the original cabinet room. But this is a, a replica of the cabinet room. And it does allow the opportunity to come in and using some buttons and stuff on the table, look at some of the president's uh, memos and decisions that he made. But it, it's, it's sort of 19, early 1990s technology. <laughs> Throughout the library, we look at ways to engage students um, and foster an interest in history. We can measure the number of students that come through our programs. In 2009, we provided educational programs to over 350,000 students and professional development for 5,000 teachers. Now, what I would really like to measure about the success of these programs, if I could, is to come back a few years later and to these students who have visited the libraries and have been in our educational programs and find out if they voted. Did you go vote in a national, state, or local election? I think that's how we can have success. And this is a picture of the presidential troop at the Hoover Library. So individually and collectively, the libraries are history laboratories. And you see two examples here. On the uh, far right is the White House Decision Center at the Truman Library. And they do actually examine the president's decision to 
drop the atomic bomb or to integrate the armed forces or recognize Israel, the, among other things. And on the left is a similar program at the Eisenhower Library called the Five Star Leaders Program. And one of the favorite experiences there is to do the D-Day invasion. And I've actually been to both of these libraries and watched these programs. And what I loved, one of the things I particularly loved about the D-Day program at Eisenhower is the students role play the different commanders, the British, the Americans, the meteorologists. And a number of students have gone on to study meteorology after graduating <laughs> uh, because they found it so interesting that the weather played such an important part in the D-Day trip. Libraries also uh, remind us of major events in our national life. This is the 65th anniversary of D-Day at the Eisenhower Library. And uh, we, um, I, I'm sorry, I have the wrong number there. It was 13,500 visitors that came. It doubled the size of the town. And you see some of the reenactors on the porch of Eisenhower's boyhood home. And it was very moving to see all the World War II veterans there. And this is a picture of my father, who was a World War II veteran who came from Abilene, Kansas. We have at the libraries um, national remembrance. This, uh, this is a picture of Mrs. Johnson's public viewing at the LBJ Library. But we've had public viewings for President Reagan, President Ford, Senator Kennedy, and many years ago for President Johnson. The library, I laugh sometimes a little bit because you know, I kind of run a cemetery program. We have um, seven presidents who are actually buried at their presidential library sites. The future of presidential libraries. Congress had a lot of, has had a lot of concern about uh, the cost of managing presidential libraries. And in some instances, as the system has aged, as I said earlier, the FDR, the FDR library has um, $22 million to do a complete renovation of it. But the fact that um, presidents leave office with low levels of approval, that libraries cost money, um, is part of the reason that Congress sometimes expresses concern. The Presidential Historical Records Preservation Act of 2008 required the archivist to submit a report to Congress on alternative models for presidential libraries that would reduce the financial burden to the government, um, improve the preservation of presidential records, and reduce the delay in public access. Now, there are a lot of tension among these three cha charges because alternatives that might reduce the financial burden would not necessarily result in better preservation or quicker access, where improvements in preservation and access would definitely cost more money. We presented a report um, last fall that had five possible models. The first was the current model with some revisions to, um, to the endowments required from the foundations to make them more, the libraries more cost effective. A uh, second alternative was a, uh, a model in which we would lease a presidential archival depository and there would be a separate foundation managed museum. A third model involved um, a presidential archival depository donated to the National Archives with a separate museum managed by the foundation. The fourth model was a centralized depository managed by NARA, probably located in Washington, DC. And the fifth model was the centralized depository with a museum of the presidency, but using private funds to develop the educational and exhibit programs. Now, it's not the first time the archives ever ask us to consider alternatives. And to do our cost analysis, we actually had to move out to a 75-year cycle in order to save money. Because the, the model that saves the most money, Model 4, costs $100 million to start with, because you'd have to build the facility to house the records. So it would take a great deal of time to recoup the, uh, the savings. And in the end, after 75 years, you could expect to save about $6 million a year over the cost of having separate presidential libraries throughout the system. So um, if you look at 
Model 1, which was the current model with uh, a, a higher level of uh, endowment, and Model 4 here, you see over the cost of the 75-year cost of these two models, it's only about $400,000 difference, $450,000, $450 million difference over 75 years. But we like, because I said I love presidential libraries, we like to think of them as a national asset. And at the 50th anniversary of the Truman Library, David McCullough addressed the subject of presidential libraries. And he said at that time, the presidential library system works, and it works in many ways that ought to be clearly understood. Part of the value of coming to a presidential library is that you come to a place where the president came from. My feeling for presidential libraries is really deep, he went on to say, and so difficult to express. Don't ever think our presidential libraries aren't worth everything that has been put into them, and then some. And the fact that they are spreading out to so many different locales in the country is wonderful. It's bringing to history to every part of our nation, and this is very important for the education of our children and grandchildren. And this is, this is David speaking at the 50th anniversary of the Truman Library, and here he is doing research in the uh, research room at the Truman Library, where he worked on his famous book about Truman. One interesting thing I think about presidential libraries, it's the one office elected by every American. And so why should it all be in Washington? I think it belongs out around the country where you can benefit from programs like this. The presidential libraries, I think, are uniquely uh, positioned to sponsor conferences and programs that bring together historians, academics, journalists, and decision makers, and have been doing so for more than 50 years. The examination of issues over several presidencies in a multi-library format is a new endeavor for us. It's part of, you know, that when I talked about having one goal uh, in, in uh, professionalizing our museum experiences, my second goal was to unify the system so that we would have an understanding of the timeline of history. No issues don't exist in a stovepipe. The, 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 the story of the Mideast goes back many presidential administrations, Vietnam, uh, you know, uh, all of those issues, civil rights, are told through um, several uh, presidential administrations. And this picture shows the uh, conference that we had on Vietnam. And you know, I looked at, I was looking at the list of people who were at that conference, David Halverstan, Brian Williams, Francis Fitzgerald, Henry Kissinger, Jack Valenti, Ted, Ted Sorensen, Alexander Haig, Jeffrey Kimball, and I thought, Several of them have already died. So it's important to bring these people together and re-examine uh, with the lens of history what happened. Uh, and we, happily, you know, we have a very wonderful relationship with C-SPAN, and they usually um, uh, televise many of our conferences. The presidential libraries are supported in part by their foundations. In 2009, the federal budget was $64 million in operating costs and another $15.5 million in repair and restoration costs. The libraries received in 2009 $7.6 million from their foundations. And beyond these dollars, the, uh, the libraries continued to derive many significant benefits from the staff and programs of the foundations. They provide indirect support and wider recognition of the works of each library. Special projects such as museum renovations at the FDR, Bush 41, and Carter Library provided $5.5 million, $8.3 million, and $10 million respectively to those libraries uh, to complete those renovations. The Air Force One and Discovery Center at the Reagan Library, and this is the Air Force One Center at the Reagan Library, was. $56 million in foundation funds to support that. The tension, though, that exists over legacy, history, and politics is never greater than in this relationship. The library's view of its stewardship of public history can at times be in conflict with the foundation's stewardship of the president's legacy. But recent new exhibits at FDR, Bush 41, Truman, and Carter are example of this partnership working at its best. 
a key is really in understanding where a presidential library is in its life cycle. New and mature, or with a living president, all of these things come into play as we think about what the exhibits in the library should be about. At the mature state, stage in a library, I think one of the best practices is to vet the exhibit with historians and other exhibits, which is what they did at the Truman Library and what they're doing at the Roosevelt Library. I don't think historical balance has to come at the expense of the president's legacy. No president ever assumed office saying he was going to do a bad job. Every president wants to do the best he can, and the 44 men who have been the president of this country did their best often under the most harrowing of circumstances. And there should be celebratory exhibits at the libraries, but there should also be examinations that look at critical moments in the life of the president and in the issues that he dealt with from multiple perspectives, including, including the presidents. For example, the decision to drop, drop, to drop the bomb uh, is one that looks at it from Truman's perspective, but it looks at it from the perspective of many other uh, uh, historians and stakeholder groups. The, I think to do this is probably the most remarkable legacy a president can have. As LBJ said when he opened his museum, it's all here with the bark off, and it should be there in the museums. So. With that, I'd be happy to take some questions from you. Do you feel that confidential information are also made public in the library or right, that uh, the president were able to isolate that and not give it to the library? Our pro oh, well, There are two factors here. Up until President Nixon, presidents left office with all their papers. They, we, they were their personal property. George Washington filled up you know, three wagon loads of records and the mules took them back to uh, Mount Vernon. After Nixon, Congress reexamined this idea and passed the Presidential Records Act. And under the Presidential Records Act, the president, all the records must come to the archives. The archivist takes control of those records starting uh, 12 noon on January 20th. We work consistently with the White House on providing guidance on maintaining records and keeping records. Now, as a concession, I think, to the presidents and also to, um, to protect some executive privileges, the president was given the right to impose certain restrictions for a period of time. And one of those restrictions is confidential advice. And that the president can restrict for a period up to 12 years after he leaves office. After that, if he wishes to restrict confidential advice further, he must claim executive privilege and only a living former president can claim executive privilege or the incumbent president can claim executive privilege on the former's records, which is why we notify the White House when we get ready to open records. To date, only about, well, originally 62 pages and now down to 35 pages from the Reagan administration have ever been withheld for executive privilege. The other factor that you should realize is that um, the law, the Presidential Records Act, gives us only the uh, constitutional and statutory records that reflect those duties of the president. Political records are not part of the equation and don't necessarily come to the National Archives, although we, we work to have them donated to us. Interestingly, you know, Gerald Ford and uh, um, presidents prior to Ford were able to give their papers to the government and they gave everything, you know. So they, they passed to the government their political papers and the papers of their records as president. I wondered if you would address the uh, transition of the Ford Library from when it was run only by the foundation to when it was taken over by the National Archives. 
and how the how some of the exhibits, especially Watergate, changed after that transition? Well, the the Ford Library was always managed by. I said Ford. I'm sorry. I meant Nixon. How, how the transition of the Nixon Library from foundation support to National Archives. Okay, I understand. Uh, Interesting, there was a lot of controversy about our taking the Nixon Library into the system. Uh, when it ori uh, originally, um, we were on the verge of accepting the Nixon Library into the system in 1995, but uh, an issue arose over, um, it was a tax issue that arose for the family, and so it was postponed. And after the public got wind of it, and especially journalists, there was a lot of there were a lot of editorials about why we shouldn't take over the Nixon Library. Well, when we fast forward to 2005, when we began to talk to the Nixon Foundation again about transferring uh, the Nixon Library to the government, and I should make it clear, they approached us about making this transfer. We did not approach them. And we came back and said, well, we wouldn't mind doing it, and we would like to have it as part of the system. It, it creates that consistent timeline uh, of, of the presidency. But there are some things that have to change, and one was the Watergate exhibit. You know, We said we have to have a more uh, complete account of how Watergate happened. And so at the time of the transfer, we took out the Watergate exhibit. Now, the new exhibit is partially installed and will be completed by July 1st. And the interesting way that we're doing it is through oral history interviews. Uh, what uh, the director of the library has done is, is conducted oral histories with every living participant in Watergate that he could find and many others who were involved in the decisions afterwards. And he's going to use the words of all of those people to tell the story of Watergate and what happened. And the original exhibit, which I think constitutes the president's point of view about that exhibit, and in and, in and of itself, it's an important artifact because that's how the president viewed Watergate. So we have a um, we have recorded that exhibit, and that will be available to viewers as they go through um, the Watergate exhibit at the library. I, I understand that there's some changes being made to President Gerald Ford's uh, library museum. And I was wondering if you could speak to those, maybe. Well, I think the, the foundation is in the process of raising funds to develop a new design. We say that um, I think the present one was installed in 1997. So we say really the life of a, of a permanent exhibit is 10 to 15 years. Um, it's a chance to re-examine uh, the historical content of the exhibit and to update the technology used in the exhibit. Uh, exhibiting techniques change and uh, the library staff and the foundation are working with an exhibit designer. In fact, I think it's the same, de it's the same designer that did the Carter Library. So I expect that it will be a you know, very nice exhibit when it's completed. I don't know what the time frame is on completing it, Joe. 2013 to President's 100th birthday. President's 100th birthday, birthday, the centennial. So that's when it will be done. We want a smart table, just like the A smart, smart table. table. <laughs> Concerning the role of women, uh, has the portrayal of Eleanor Roosevelt's role in the Roosevelt administration and in FDR's life uh, evolved in recent years, and uh, a related matter, uh, do you have any relationship uh, with the National Women's History Museum in Seneca Falls, New York? Well, on the latter, no, and I haven't been there either. Um, and on Eleanor Roosevelt, there is a wing of the library that's really devoted to Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and they are, I know the, the library um, is working with a group of historians in designing the new exhibit and vetting that exhibit with historians. So I expect there'll be a, a pretty uh, full examination of Eleanor Roosevelt's life, which was is almost as important as Franklin Roosevelt's life. Amen. But I, I, haven't, I haven't seen what they're doing yet. That's a good segue for my comment and question. 
Um, I went through Hyde Park, New York this summer on a bike ride, and uh, we were, had a whole day off to go through the, um, the Franklin Library and Museum. And, and the home? And, yep, and also Valkill, which is mm -hmm. Eleanor's, and I, it just blew me away. <laughs> it is just the most amazing place. And um, the exhibit is, is great. I can't wait to go back and see the renovation. But um, it, and you know, this was last summer when you know, we're still in the depths of our downturn and it was just really amazing to see what was going on in 1933 as opposed to now. And, and it, it, I just recommend it highly. They have a wonderful exhibit on the, um, on the first 100 days of Roosevelt's administration. And uh, the curator there, interestingly, is a man named Herman Eberhardt. And he um, curated that exhibit and will be, of course, working on the re redesign of the Roosevelt Library. But he's the person who curated the Truman decision to drop the bomb. Well, I did come away with um, uh, the opinion and feeling that Eleanor Roosevelt was as important as Franklin. If, if not for her, the two of them were, a, you know, they were a team. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it just changed the whole, qu it, it, we wouldn't have this country today as it is if it weren't for them. And um, I think they should keep rolling out these libraries wherever these presidents are from. And uh, do you know where Obama's going to put his? Well, I don't know, but uh, the Hawaii, I, saw, I got in the, I, we get these news clips um, at work uh, on anything that mentions presidential libraries, and I saw the Hawaii State Legislature passed a, uh, a resolution urging uh, Obama to build his presidential library in Hawaii. But I, and I have talked to people at the University of Hawaii, and I've also talked to people in the Chicago area. So we stay. We stay pretty neutral about where these libraries should be. I, I like to tell the story, though, that um, I said I voted in 11 presidential elections. I, I tell people that we always vote for the incumbent in my business because it's very challenging to move a president out of office who has lost the election. <laughs> I want you to know that presidents in their first term in office do not plan on where they're going to build their library. They don't even think about the library. They don't, because if they're caught thinking about their library, then the people will say, well, he thinks he's going to lose, and you know. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe they should have a, a cruise ship, a <laughs> presidential cruise ship. Then our other factor is that, uh, that when, after a two-term president has left office and we're electing a brand new president, we look at where they might build their presidential library. So. In that connection, uh, has the president uh, identified any staff member who should uh, begin to uh, think about uh, library? No, but I, no, he hasn't. He hasn't. I know, um, I, I, I was interested though, um, I saw in the newspaper an article about the pens the president used to sign the health care bill, and the last sentence said, that two pins were being given to the National Archives. So I think that's for his presidential library. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about uh, FOIA requests and how the presidential library staff deal with FOIA requests. Um, we've had the opportunity here um, at SI to, you know, discuss the response of different federal agencies to FOIA requests, and I mm -hmm. wondered what um, the presidential library staff, how, how they deal with them. Oh, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, well, FOIA is a, ch are you an archivist? Yes. OK, it's great, great. Because um, you can't imagine how difficult it is for archivists to work against the FOIA. It, it, it's the opposite of everything that you want to do as an archivist. People bring in their FOIA requests, they send them in, they're by subject. Um, and that involves pulling records from all sorts of collections all through the library and bringing those together to process for this particular FOIA request. 
It's very different than systematic processing. It takes a lot of time because you have to go through many, many indexes in the library to find the particular documents and files that relate to the request. Then you have to bring them, you have to leave out cards behind, pull them, leave out cards behind, track on all your databases where these records have come from, and then process them. So it takes a lot, it takes, three or four times as long. You know, we, we can process 250,000 pages a year through FOIA and a million pages a year systematically in a library. But we're not doing a good enough job. And so we've been looking the last three years at how we can improve. And we've made a number of changes to how we process <coughs> presidential records in addition to getting support from Congress for more archivists in these Presidential Record Act libraries where we deal with FOIA. Among the things that we do, we have a queue structure that's, that places easy requests in one queue, more difficult requests in another queue, classified requests in another queue. We also partition the request so that if your request is huge, you want um, everything on terrorism in America. <laughs> and people ask those kind of questions. <laughs> You'll get 5,000 pages at a time, and then you'll go to the bottom of the list. The other thing that we do um, is to group requests. When we get lots of similar kind of requests that involve pulling records from similar files, we'll combine those together and process those records systematically so we're dealing with um, a greater volume of requests and we get those out. When Congress gave us the additional resources for the presidential libraries, we committed to taking part of those resources and using them for systematic processing. With the hope being that if we identified the right records to process systematically, the records that people want, not the records they don't want, we could get ahead of the curve. You know? So we, we're systematically processing at this rate and the FOIA requests are coming in at this rate, and eventually the FOIA requests match up against the systematic processing and the records are open. So that's what we're doing now, and uh, the libraries have been able to increase their processing threefold so far, and uh, with the training, we're still in the process of training all the new archivists, and I expect when their training is completed in another year, we'll get to, uh, you know, at least a million pages a year in each library. So I'm very pleased at the progress we're making, but it's slow. And, you know, I, I'll add something else, too, that is overwhelming. Electronic records. When we, at the end of the uh, Clinton administration, we brought in four terabytes of electronic records. At the end of the Bush administration, we brought in 80 terabytes of electronic records. I can't imagine what it's going to be at the end of the Obama administration as we move to social media, cloud computing, and all these other factors. And there are, um, uh, there were four or five million email messages in the uh, Clinton administration. There's um, about 16 to 18 million in the, um, the Bush administration. Each email message we think averages about three pages when you consider the attachments. Look how many pages that is. There are more pages than we have in the presidential libraries all combined. So it's not really going to be possible for years and years and years to process all those. And so the way I look at processing these records, I, I, can, I, I think of the, um, of the electronic records as, as almost a black hole. And, <laughs> and what we do through uh, process, systematic processing, when we do systematic processing, we'll pick a date. You know, for example, in the Bush administration, we're going to want to pick dates around 9 11 because people are going to be very interested in what was the email traffic around that date. We'll choose events, we'll choose certain people, we'll process their email and email around those particular events. And then we'll have the FOIA requests that come in. So we're gonna shine pinholes of light into this abyss for certain subjects and certain dates, but processing all of it is nigh impossible until such time has passed. And I don't know what that length of time is, whether it's 50 years or 75 years when we can just declare victory and open it all. 
<laughs> but part of the problem that we have in opening records now is not, a gentleman asked about confidential advice. That's one area we have to look. We have classified uh, material, and that has to be declassified, not by the National Archives, but by the agencies who have the equity or the ownership of that classified information. But third, a big factor now is privacy. Um, if you wrote a letter to the president, if you sent him an email, your email address is there, and that's considered PII information. Um, one of the things that people often do uh, for former presidents is they'll write to him and say, oh, you know, my, uh, my grandparents are having their 50th wedding anniversary, can you send a letter? And they send all this personal information about their grandparents, you know, names, addresses, phone numbers, all that's PII information. And the government has become so strict about that information that we have to redact it, a lot of it. Uh, and that's very, very time consuming when you do that. So. Maybe it'd be like the census records. Census records are open after 72 years, so maybe after 72 years we can open this. Uh, is, are any of the libraries doing what Google is doing here in the U of M? You're copying all the materials in the library. Repeat the question. Oh, are, he's asking if any of the libraries are doing what Google is doing here, copying all the material. We have a lot of digitizing programs in the libraries. Uh, there isn't yet one to do everything. Uh, the Kennedy Library actually started out with a, a digital project. They were going to digitize their entire collection, and then they discovered how much money it would cost and how long it would take and how much storage uh, it takes to store all those files. So uh, they are, they've become more selective about what they're digitizing. They probably have the largest digitization project to date within the presidential library system. But you know what? It's getting easier all the time, and it's going to change. You know, I can't predict in 10 years what we'll be able to digitize and how easily we'll be able to do it. So I think uh, a lot can happen. Another area where we digitize our collection, we digitize all of our classified holdings. As they reach 25 years of age, we, uh, we scan them, and then they're sent into Washington to be reviewed by the federal agencies that own the classification equity in the record. And after they review them, they're sent back to the library and processed back in. The Ford Library has been involved in this project, and I think they've gotten probably three or four hundred thousand pages back so far. Uh, closer to 142,000 pages back so far. And they'll be making those available to the public. I have somebody back yeah. there. Hi, um, could you explain a little bit about Obama's new order for declassifying documents and how that pertains to presidential libraries? Yes. He, he wrote an executive order. There have been, people have been issuing executive orders about declassifying records since, um, since Bill Clinton's in 1995, wrote the first one. And uh, all of them have been dealing with records that were 25 years or old or older. Well, when Clinton wrote the first one, everything that had ever been created that was classified, and very little of it had ever been declassified, was out there in the pool to be considered. And as each year goes by, more and more documents reach 25 years of age. So the agencies have had a hard time getting the job finished. Uh, and it's complicated by things like the Kyle Lott Amendment, which required the Department of Energy um, go through every single document to make sure that we weren't revealing any nuclear information. Because there were, I think there were two or three or four documents that were released that had some old nuclear information and people got concerned about it, so they go, they're going through that. So Obama's latest executive order sets up a national declassification center. And presidential libraries will be a part of that National Declassification Center. It's being run through the National Archives. It creates a place where we can centralize the declassification effort rather than all of the agencies uh, doing their own declassification work at their agencies. They'll send declassifiers to the National Archives and they'll go through the material there. And then they, they have a couple of, I think, two years to complete that 25-year-old material. Hi, in terms of public funding of presidential libraries, does, it, does the funding in any way relate to the length of term of each president? 
um, for instance, if a president serves eight years, two terms, that there'd be more public funding, that the library would be larger? No, actually, no, it doesn't. Um, the, the Presidential Libraries Act um, actually restricts the size of libraries to about 70,000 square feet, which actually we found very difficult because one and two term presidents have the same amount of space to deal with. Now, they can build a library that's larger than that. The foundation can provide the government a slightly larger building. But the larger it is, the higher their endowment will be. And it goes, it, it's a sort of geometric progression in the formula. So every library we received since the passage of that act has been under 70,000 square feet of usable space. And as for the funding, the federal funding for the libraries, it differs across the country. And that's because the cost of living in different parts of the country is different. The Kennedy Library is our most expensive library to operate, not because it's the largest. It's because it's in Boston. And the cost of living is higher in Boston. The cost of contracts for support of the library, our operations and maintenance contracts, our security contracts, the salary for the staff is higher because of locality pay in Boston. Um, the largest library in the system is Reagan, but it's not the most expensive to operate. Ford has uh, is sort of in the middle, even though um, uh, Ford was only president for a little over three years because it's in two buildings, so we have two facilities to operate. And interestingly, it'll be the last time we ever do two facilities. It's written into the architectural and design standards <laughs> that the foundations can only give us one building, not two. <laughs> and one more question. Can you speak to um, libraries in other nations, such as Canada, maybe France? Do they have anything similar in terms of preserving? Well, in Germany, they have something similar. Um, I think in, in um, with, the, with prime ministers, uh, the, the records are really part of the, the parliament kind of thing, and they go to a central repository. Um, Canada, uh, Germany has um, chancellor libraries around the country. Uh, other places, but there are more museums than there are libraries. I don't think they have that many of the records actually in those uh, chancellor um, libraries. I'm often visited by um, foreign emissaries who are looking at what it would be to build a presidential library. But my advice is usually, unless you have strong records laws in your, in your country, I think it's very hard to have a presidential library system because you really are dependent on the availability of those records to the, to the citizenry mm -hmm. and the rights of the citizenry to have access to the records, that they, all the records they can legally have access to. And if you don't have that, if you have a dictatorship or some other form of government, I don't think a presidential library works very well. It then really is a, a temple or just a memorial rather than a place of scholarship and research. Um, Dick Cheney is in the public office. Are his emails available, or will they ever be available? Sure. Um, you can begin to FOIA Dick Cheney's email in January of 2000 and see, he left office in 2000, um, 2008, five years, 2013. You can, you can file a FOIA for those records.